Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Paulo Calvi. I'm hosting this afternoon a roundtable in the Brazilian presidential elections um, that are upcoming on uh, October the 2nd uh, as part of the Mary Colvin Center lecture series. Um, we have great guests today. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, journalism has this as a great perk, right? Well, besides the obscene amounts of money that we are all making, uh, always making in journalism. And the perk is having access to some of the most interesting people uh, in the world, uh, people who have vast and underground knowledge uh, on many subjects. And uh, this, this knowledge and this group of people come very handy when something important is going on, but you don't have all the tools to explain it. Um, Mary was very good at that, finding the right people to discuss those issues she was passionate about. And this series of lectures and roundtables on global issues is a way to honor her curiosity and ours. Uh, so among the people we have met and the people uh, who know about Brazil, I'm very happy to introduce a tremendous panel of experts. Um, some of whom are journalists. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, last minute commitment prevented one of them, a uh, former Chancellor Celso Marim, to be part of our discussion today. Uh, he sent his regards and hopes for our discussion to be fruitful, and I don't doubt it will be. So we have three excellent panelists today. Um, Vince Vevins, uh, author of The Jakarta Method, a tremendous book, uh, which you have probably read in my class, if you are in my class. Uh, and probably somewhere else you've heard about it. It's been highly praised by critics ranging from Leo Schwartz in the LA Times to Grace Blakely from Jacobin and Glenn Greenwald from The Intercept. Uh, Vince have worked as a foreign correspondent for the LA Times, the Financial Times, and the Washington Post. Um, Ana Clara Costa, who is political uh, journalist for Piauí, uh, an excellent cultural magazine based in Rio de Janeiro, I would say I mean, I mean, saying the best is probably not great because we don't know, like factually, but it's a really great magazine. Uh, she worked as a political editor for Veja, uh, has been editor of Globo in Brasilia and uh, chief editor of Epoca. And we have uh, Professor uh, uh, Murilo Daragao, uh, founder and CEO of ARCO, Advice Pesquisas, again, one of the most prestigious analysts, analysis and political organizations in Brazil. Uh, um, Professor Munoz is also a lawyer. He's a journalist and uh, professor at Columbia University and a columnist of Beja magazine. So um, I ask you to thank our guests who are very busy, but uh, they showed up uh, with a round of hands, uh, especially considering that they are probably uh, preparing for the elections uh, between the incumbent Jerry Bolsonaro and two-term president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, who will be uh, the, the the elections will be taking place on October second. So, um, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. I'm going to start the panel uh, with a question for each one of the panelists. I'm going to start with Vince. Uh, Vince, you lived in Sao Paulo. You live in Sao Paulo. Um, you corresponded from there, you covered the ascent of Bolsonaro to power. Uh, a couple of months ago, you were there for the wake of your mentor and friend, Don Phillips, uh, who was a guard, uh, the Guardian environmentalist reporter who was killed in the Amazon basin. Uh, you witnessed Bolsonaro's reaction to that incident. You also know Lula, you're familiar with the Lava Jato affair. Uh, I talk about it. Uh, can you speculate? What type of candidate are Lula and Bolsonaro, and what they type of the nation can we expect with uh, regards to re-election or the third term of the other candidate? Yeah, um, no, there's a lot. There's a lot to get into there. And first, thank you so much for for having me. This is um, important and, and uh, exciting. Uh, and you know, scary all at the same time. Um, yeah, you're right. I was I was recently in Rio for the funeral of my friend Dom Phillips, who was killed in the Amazon. Uh, we worked together for 12 years. Um, sometimes very closely, sometimes just always helping each other out and keeping track of what we were doing. And the way that Bolsonaro intervened into this particular case was quite awful. 
Um, and it, it was the kind of thing that he didn't need to do. He didn't need to make this murder in the Amazon about him, right? He, he didn't need to come into this and make this a Bolsonaro thing. But of course, he was always going to, right? And that tells you a lot about who Bolsonaro has always been as a, as a politician and president. He was always going to take this, this tragedy um, very far from the Capitol that he could have stayed silent about. He could have just very, made very, you know, customary decla declarations are about it's, you know, it's, it's tragic when people die in my country. But he has always been somebody whose principal activity as a politician is to uh, provoke and to draw attention to himself. This is mostly what he did. Um, essentially, all he did in his 30 years or so jumping around between nine different parties uh, in Congress. Uh, this is what he did as a presidential candidate. Um, and um, this is what he did when Dom died. So I, I forget the exact words. He said something to the extent that Dom and Bruno uh, were on an adventure, that it wasn't safe for them to be out there. And, you know, the way that the Bolsonaro discourse always works to, to his supporters, it's clear what this means. It means they deserved what happened to them. Um, they shouldn't have been messing around other people's business, doing journalism or working with indigenous groups. Um, but the fact that this is the way that Bolsonaro has continued to operate even as president, really gets to the core of what will be the likely uh, range of outcomes uh, in October, because a lot of people voted for Bolsonaro in 2018. Um, people that were not uh, committed, Bolsonaristas, people that were not committed to a right-wing project, thinking that he would do something else as president other than provoke an attack. And he hasn't really. Um, and this has been uh, key, I think, to uh, the collapse of his support in, in, in important sectors of the Brazilian of Brazilian civil society. Um, but from the perspective of, you know, a, a foreign journalist having covered a lot of elections in Brazil um, and around the world, a couple of things really stand out about this particular one, the, the, the contest we're about to witness in, in October. And one is how simple uh, and stable the actual race has been for quite a long time. While, um, the elements outside of the race itself are important and very complicated. So what I mean when I say that the race is simple and stable is that for as long as it's been clear that there's that Lula is allowed to run, it's been fairly obvious that Lula and Bolsonaro are going to be the final two candidates. It's been clear to most everyone in the country who those people are. And the polling has stayed basically the same the entire time. Looks like Lula is going to get a lot more votes. Bolsonaro is going to get less votes and a bunch of other people, despite the the attempts of several uh, uh, of a lot of sectors uh, in the media and the business class, they're not going to be in, in the second round if there is one. And everybody remembers who Lula is. He was the president for eight years. Things were objectively better for a lot of people then. And everybody knows who Bolsonaro is. He's this person who, as I said, promised to do more than provoke uh, in 2018 and didn't do much more than that. But on the other hand, there are all these other elements that don't usually get slotted into the types of things that journalists normally pay attention to when they're when they're uh, covering an electoral contest. Because the question of what happens after Lula presumably gets more votes than Bolsonaro becomes very complicated. Um, because it, all uh, a lot of <laughs> evidence coming from the president of Brazil himself indicates that he's going to say that he won, no matter what the the, the eventual. Uh, eventual vote count is. And so I did a story earlier this year for the New York Review of Books, uh, looking at all the different sectors in Brazilian society that would be necessary, um, the the power centers that would need to support democracy for democracy to triumph in, 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 a, in a crisis situation, and or that would need to support a Bolsonaro in a coup attempt for a coup attempt to succeed. Uh, I looked at the military, that's always the classic thing to analyze in Latin America. I looked at uh, business elites within the country. I looked at international investors. I looked at the international community, which is often just the, the governments of rich countries uh, and um, uh, the media. I think that I already say the media. Um, and it seems like, and this has been sort of where I've been paying a lot of attention because the, the horse race thing, nothing's happening. Where I've been paying a lot of attention the last 12 months is how do those sectors, how do those powers, uh, those centers of power outside the official political uh, contest um, what does it look like that they will do in the case of a, uh, a Lula victory and Bolsonaro claiming that he won? And it seems that uh, over the last year, a lot of those um, extra political, extra parliamentary, unofficial centers of power 
have lined up behind the idea that no, if if Lula wins, we will back democracy. We will go forward with this. If that happens, that will be the first president elected in Brazil since what is it, 2014, with uh, unquestionable legitimacy, right? With with yeah, some of that, that, that's, some, what, that's what I was going to say. Like the the uh, the, the this election basically is what is at stake is uh, a return to the normal normal democratic order in Brazil, right? In, mm -hmm. in because yeah. you know, it's a Lava Jato, nothing has been very, very uh, crystal clear on one side or the other. Uh, Vince, uh, let me ask uh, Murilo, because you, Murilo, you have the your hand on the pulse of the uh, polls, and and we were talking about it yesterday. You you were saying that things are uh, slowly uh, tilting or shifting a bit. Um, do you want to? Um, Tell us what 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 is your uh, what is your sense of what's uh, what what the where the vote is going? Well, actually, I agree with with, with Vincent about the, the the stability of the election these days. Lula and Bolsonaro clearly are the favorites. The third way were unable to create uh, uh, enough support to be really competitive. Uh, and we have uh, two uh, very radical narratives uh, disputing the first place. Probably the election will be decided in the second round. Uh, currently, Lula is the favorite to win because he has less rejection than Bolsonaro. But we cannot uh, make a precise uh, uh, definition about what will happen in, in the end of the second round because so far uh, both candidates has uh, uh, what we call in Brazil glass ceiling telhado de vidro so both can attack each other in a relevant manner that could shift uh, the support from uh, one side to another but clearly Lula is enjoying the situation to be the the, the favorite because uh, the circumstances and all the uh, competitive advantage that Bolsonaro had as the president uh, and the use of the state machinery is not working uh, in his favor. And besides that, the fact that the war with the media uh, is paying a price for Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro is losing, uh, lost the support that he had uh, in the previous election, it's important to, to remember that Bolsonaro was elected not because the Bolsonaristas, not because the radical supports uh, supporters that he has. Uh, he was elected by the voters that do not want to vote in favor of politics. It was an anti-politics uh, election. And this election uh, is a different one. It's a, an election where the two... Uh, candidates that are leading the race has uh, a high, uh, higher, uh, high, has significant rates of rejection. Bolsonaro uh, are, are over 50 percent, almost 60 percent, and Lula around 40 percent. So both are enjoying a lot of rejection from the voters. But people are choosing now what they think will be the last uh, bed uh, between two. So it's a very negative. Election is an election where people are choosing not in an affirmative vote, uh, manner in favor of one can, candidate, and that's why I explain what was the, the 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 lack of people in the streets supporting Lula. If you compare Bolsonaro uh, uh, events and Lula events, there are much more people going to Bolsonaro events, giving the impression that Bolsonaro has more support. Uh, from the population, but this is not true. The polls are, are, are precise, with some mistakes from here and there, uh, showing that Lula is the is the one that the people prefer. But these people, these voters, are not willing to go to the streets to support Lula. They are just willing to vote to Lula in Lula because they don't want Bolsonaro. So far, but we have enough time to change. What, which is unlike, unlike to, 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 to happen, but elections are elections. We have to wait the final 
the final uh, result. Um, I was uh, I was talking earlier uh, with Ana Clara. Ana Clara, you were telling me maybe this is an explanation of why the vibe on the street is different than what you see in the polls. And that has to do with the level of aggression. You were telling me that the, the, this is a very unusual election in terms of the level of aggression on the streets between uh, different sectors, especially the extreme right, like very aggressively pitting themselves against uh, anything that they perceive as left leaning or, or, or I don't know, uh, Lula oriented journalists wearing. Um, Bulletproof vests. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? What, what, what are the initial aspects of this campaign? The, the online stuff. Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation. I hope I can add something to the debate. Um, well, I've been covering elections for like 15 years, and um, like this election, I've never seen any other uh, on the past. And I see two main differences uh, between uh, these election, these elections and the former. And also, let's compare uh, this election with uh, the 2018 election that elected Bolsonaro. And, and I see two big differences: uh, one regarding communications and disinformation, another regarding security and. Uh, unsafety, for instance. Uh, uh, on the communications aspect, uh, we see in general uh, that people are more likely to distrust alternative media and ask them, themselves uh, if what they are reading or watching is true, different from uh, 2018, that uh, the phenomenon of fake news was new for everybody, for the ordinary people that didn't know that the information they were getting from WhatsApp was fake. And um, so also because of the, the disinformation and the outcome of the past elections, uh, tech companies also started to disclosure uh, tags and flags uh, directing users to official sources of uh, information uh, especially when it comes to sensitive subjects like uh, the voting machines and the pandemics. The voting machines, it's because, as uh, I think uh, Vince said before, uh, Bolsonaro will probably say, say that he, if he loses, he will say that, that he won. So uh, he's uh, putting a lot of doubt on the voting machines right now. And uh, during all this year, uh, to give some kind of, uh, I don't know, to give some kind of uh, information to his supporters to, to explain uh, why he might lose. So he, according to his narrative, he's not going to lose because people are not voting for him, but because, because voting machines are uh, completely... Uh, wrong that what's happened with Trump. So we were very familiar with this uh, kind of strategy. And uh, so uh, all of this is new. It didn't happen in 2018. Uh, and also now uh, fact-checking uh, agencies and journalists are much more uh, quick on analyzing speeches to say what is true and what is, what is false, which I think is a change from uh, the last elections. And uh, the thing is that uh, when it comes to Bolsonaro supporters, uh, what I said before is about about general people, ordinary people. But about, when it comes about uh, when it comes to Bolsonaro supporters, they kind of uh, subverted the meaning of fake news, and they mostly they are relying to traditional media outlets the image of disinformation. So all the measures took by media, tech companies, and official sources. Uh, that they took on the past two years, maybe, they tend to be dismissed by uh, the faithful supporters of Bolsonaro because many of them think that uh, all the players, the media, uh, the official uh, institutions, they are conspiring for the victory of uh, Lula. So uh, these supporters, they just don't believe uh, uh, 
traditional media outlets, they don't believe uh, official sources, especially when it comes to the su Supreme Court uh, and uh, the electoral court that we have in Brazil. So there's two different uh, sides of the uh, information spectrum and people listen to, say, the equivalent of Fox News. I don't know. What, what is the right wing? Uh, yeah, the right wing is stronger on the uh, social networks. Mm -hmm. And especially on YouTube, and that that is a difference from 2018, uh, when you had like Facebook as the main source of disinformation, and now you have like YouTube uh, as a powerful uh, tool for these groups. Because uh, especially in Brazil, you have a TV channel uh, and radio uh, that broadcasts also 24/7 uh, on YouTube called. Jovem Pan, which is uh, just like Fox News in, in the U.S. And the, they are very fundamental to spread the narrative of Bolsonaro. They are mm -hmm. part of the communication system of Bolsonaro. After Jovem Pan puts a subject uh, on air, uh, a range of all a network of uh, channels it starts to spreading this information, this kind of subject this comment and uh, so they are very powerful they have like one one show uh of job and Pan has over a hundred million uh viewers on youtube per month so this is huge this is the biggest uh communication official media outlet channel on youtube it's Jovem Pan, and it's fully uh uh mostly like 80% uh, pro Bolsonaro, so they have a very powerful, uh, uh, I don't know, role on on all of this, and um, and it didn't happen in 2018. That's another difference. And and what happens with the rallies and and the journalists who want to go there and cover, like you know, with well, the red that's, fair. That's my second point. I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to make it briefly. Uh, shortly now because I talk too much but uh, I don't know because of the polarized environment and uh, uh, some people say that also because of uh, the amount of guns allowed to the population through uh, a few Bolsonaro decrees uh, during the past four years uh, you have a, a great sense of insecurity uh, among candidates you have especially on the left wing candidates um, on the Lula campaign. Campaign. Everybody is using lot. Not everybody, but a lot of people are using uh, bulletproof vest. Um, Lula, especially, he cannot do his campaign on open places. Only closed pla places with people that pass through a security check first. Um, gun detector and uh, he cannot go on the streets to campaign. Uh, Bolsonaro also uh, avoids that because he was uh, a victim of an attack on the past elections. And uh, But he can uh, go on the streets more than Lula right now. Even being a president, which uh, regard, regarding to the security, when you are a president, you have more security than uh, anyone else. And uh, he can go on the streets, but uh, Lula can't. You have Ciro Gomes, a candidate that uh, was victim uh, of an attempt a few days ago. A guy tried to hurt him, uh, pointed him with a knife. And uh, so you have like supporters from Lula and Bolsonaro that are fighting on the streets and killing each other. It's happening. It's not like common, but it, you have some cases that are uh, uh, that we see on. Uh, on the media and uh so it's uh it's something very unique i've never seen this kind of environment before covering an election it's like the first time that i see that candidates uh are mostly uh staying in closed places uh with bullet bulletproof vests and cannot get in touch with people so uh, uh um, and this is kind of an outcome of the polarized environment that we li we're living in Brazil. There's, uh, yeah, there's an increase in um, like political violence, and you know, I, I don't know how you see that. Um, maybe Vince, you can talk about it too. 
uh, uh, Murillo, but I, I, there's there's a background of the uh, the attempt on the uh, vice president of Argentina too, Cristina, right? Like so, there's a, there's an increase in political violence that um, it looks uh, it's happening across the board, and maybe the radicalization of the political discourse has to do with it. I don't know. Uh, what do you um, what do you think, Vince? Yeah, I mean, uh, the cases of violence that we've seen so far have been have been uh, terrible. And the country for a few months now, <laughs> longer, has just felt incredibly tense. Um, there is an air of what could happen, what's going to happen. Um, politics has become something quite, I mean, it always was serious, but it's become, you know, the, the national mood has, has been really affected by the possible outcomes what could happen during the campaign and again what could happen after the campaign because you know I, I, when i outlined all of those centers of power in this in in brazil outside the the electoral process itself the one that is still seemingly kind of with bolsonaro with the bolsonarista project is the military police so there was an article that came out in the new york times recently i, I don't think it was framed really well i said so but um talk to you know the what's the real nightmare scenario what happens after the election and a large percentage of the population and many of them with guns um say that it was stolen from them that their president is being uh, removed by a cabal of sort of woke media and progressive forces and uh you know lying pollsters and lying journalists um that that i think is another possibility where things could be really um chaotic uh, and dangerous i don't I hope I hope none of this happens in the election uh, or afterwards. But this is a, a feeling that I never had covering Brazilian politics uh, either. I, I I think I know the the piece you're talking about. It was the one that that talked about the uh, revolution in Brazil. Like how yeah. do you, how do you how do you uh, as an American journalist when you read those titles? I mean, as a Latin American, it kind of makes my heart skip. A beat when I hear, well, Brazil may have a. Re what do you mean by revolution? This is a. This is not a revolution. This is a coup. Uh, what do you think when you read that from a point of view of an American journalist living in Brazil? Yeah, I, I sort of get where the analysis started, which was that um, it does. There does not seem to be the consensus among the real elites of Brazilian society, like the the high ranking. Uh, members of the military, the business class, the international investor class to allow for just a coup where you say, oh, no, no, I won. And so the next step logically is to say, well, maybe the only thing left, maybe the only other option for Bolsonarismo, if it, if it, if it does indeed try to hold on to power uh, anti-democratically, and, and Bolsonarismo has been nothing if not anti-democratic since its inception, uh, then you would have to try for an insurrection. I think that's the word that's really uh, you would have to reach for that. Um, in that case, if Bolsonaro were to try to hold on to an election after getting less votes than Lula, um, the the last the last way to try to make that happen somehow or another, I don't think I don't personally I don't think it's likely that something like this could work. But I think that the column was making a, a reasonable point that uh, in that case you would have to go for an insurrection, which is of, of course what we also call January sixth in, in in the United States, and this is not a coincidence. Uh, Bolsonaro is often acts like Trump because he's like him, and he also tries to make himself look like he's acting like Trump. I think this helps um, helps him in some ways. So yeah, that would that's you know as far as th that analysis goes uh, to saying that an, an insurrection could be the last desperate attempt at power. I'm with I was with that column. The idea that it would be a revolution is is is, is bizarre to me. Um, lots of coups have been preceded by large-scale street mobilizations it's still a coup if you ultimately hold on to power after losing an election it doesn't matter if you've uh, made a big mess in the streets first but there are there are you know i, I uh, people are um a little bit afraid that there could be a mess in the streets over the next few weeks i really hope not i hope there's a, a clean democratic transition but again um like everyone else has said this is these are things that i didn't feel in the last you know covering Brazilian elections since 2010. um Murilo, I, I, I have we don't, we don't uh, we haven't met and you don't know me, but it's rare the occasion which I agree with Steve Bannon. Uh, he said recently, uh, I don't remember what article uh, I was reading. I think LA Times or somebody interviewed him, and he said like 
the most important elections in the near horizon that are the Brazilian elections. And, and I think that uh, here in the States, uh, there's a level of awareness of what's happening there, but, uh, but would you mind uh, giving us a, um, a sense of the importance of the Brazilian elections in the context of the world and in the context of the uh, Brazilian-American relations? So what, what is the outcome uh, how is it going to um, echo in the future year, in the years like to come, if Bolsonaro is elected versus uh, re-elected versus uh, a election of Lula, right? The election of, for the third term. Uh, I think you're muted. Um, uh, cool. yeah. Pablo, uh, uh, I agree with Anna. I agree with Vicente. I think it's very difficult for Brazil to have a coup d'etat uh, because different from 64, for example, uh, there's no support from uh, the elites of the country. There's not uh, an ideology backing the idea of a coup. Uh, and also there's not uh, a will to do that. So even inside the Bolsonarismo, there are little support to the idea of doing something funny like that. And, and they know that if they attempt to do something like that, Brazil will be more or less like is Russia today in the world. Nobody will believe. And actually, uh, there's no institutions supporting uh, a possibility of a coup d'etat. I, 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 I expect, uh, even not giving a high probability, uh, to happen some protests, some confusions, uh, if the result is not the one that they will like, or if we saw something like a blackout during the, the election, uh, the results of the election, the, the process of counting the votes, a confusion like that may start uh, another confusion in the street, but not in the sense that this will... Uh, became a, or will become a, a kind of coup d'etat. Not even a, an insurrection also. Uh, uh, the, the meaning of the election, uh, I believe, is less, much less than, much important, less important than Steve Bannon is saying that. For Steve Bannon, uh, if, if Bolsonaro wins, is a hope that the, the rightist mentality will have a guy that will uh, uh, reinforce the narrative uh, in the world. But actually, Brazil, even being, even being uh, uh, an important country in the economics, has little impact uh, in, the, in the culture or in the political culture of the world. Uh, so I do not see the election of Brazil being uh, really an event in political terms in the world. It's much more an economic event in this sense. And why it is an economic event? Because Brazil is a provider of commodities, is a very important provider of, of commodities, one of the top five producers of food in the world, uh, and has uh, uh, ample opportunities of investments in infrastructure, and the investors from the United States, from Europe, and from Asia are looking for that. So Brazil has in the pipeline almost one billion reais in in investments uh, in in infrastructure in Brazil, and and the and the investors, uh, Wall Street and others, they 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 follow close Brazil, much more close than uh, than we think. You know, they 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 look for for the sectors, they look for the political environment. And if they do not trust in Brazil, they, they, do, they will not invest in Brazil. And if you look back in the last two or three years, uh, important investors were doing inversions in Brazil uh, in, the, in the water and sewage uh, activities and refining, oil refining, for example, and, and the airports, uh, roads and other uh, the infrastructure projects in Brazil. And these people... Uh, they are aware that we can have an election and change uh, the guard, uh, while Lula can be the president. They trust that Brazil will remain Brazil with their advantages and their problems uh, regarding who will be the president in 2023. 
And why? Because they know that Brazil has very strong institutions, public institutions and private institutions. Uh, if you look in the private sector, it's a country with some five, six strong banks, uh, big companies like Vale, Gerdau, Embraer, and much other. So if you look for the landscape in Latin America, you don't see any other country with such a quality and amount of companies, uh, uh, strong institutions in the private sector operating uh, in, a, in a very positive manner. And on the other hand, we have very strong also public institutions, the diplomacy, the Brazilian IRS, the Central Bank of Brazil that now is operating with autonomy, uh, the BNDS, the, the developing bank, uh, Banco do Brazil, Caixa Econômica, and, and others. So the, all of these the, uh, multipolar institutions that we have uh, is a, go, uh, projects a sign of, of, of trust for Brazil. So regard, regardless who will be the president in 2023, uh, this will be considered and Brazil will still be considered an interesting place to do business. And, 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 and with, uh, with, uh, with that idea, and in fact, you know, there's been a continuity since Lula. Uh, Wall Street loved Lula too, so it's not that uh, he was. Uh, no, even with Fernando Henrique Cardoso, also. So uh, yeah. the relationship between the financial system of Brazil and the financial system of the United States are very good. The, the relationship between the two central banks are very good. And besides that, Brazil is a very good client of the treasurer of the United States. We have some $200 billion in uh, American bonds. So this is something that gives uh, uh, a trust for those who want to invest in the country. But it's also true that if uh, Lula locks the election, do you have a geopolitical um, map that is changing? Like it, it looks like the return of the the pink tide in a sense, right? Um, I don't know if uh, Vince or uh, Anna Clara want to comment on that. I couldn't, I couldn't hear the last part of your question. Yeah, uh, that if Lula locks the election, it, it seems like there's going to be a scenario that will repeat what, I mean, enhance because we have Petro now, but there's a, there's a pink tide again. Um, coming back to Latin America. I don't know if the geopolitical equation changes a little bit and, and how would that affect um, you know, uh, political relations at large? I don't think that, uh, if I can answer first, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, Lula's campaign is uh, uh, formulating a multilateral uh, force uh, uh, regarding uh, these other uh, political leaderships in Latin America, and uh, and also I don't think that uh, Petro or uh, Boric, uh, the new presidents of Chile and Colombia, are seen as even if they are left wing. I think they are uh, of a new generation that uh, the world don't see any democratic risk, any political risk, uh, as you see in Venezuela, for instance, uh, with Maduro and in Nicaragua and, and et cetera. So I think that uh, the main issue, if Lula wins uh, regarding uh, the geopolitical uh, um, figure, uh, is uh, what's going to be his... Uh, his uh, look to Venezuela and to Nicaragua more than to Chile and, and to Colombia and uh, what uh, what what will be the relationship between these uh, three countries and what's the message that uh, he will pass uh, through this relationship he usually uh, he had been a very pragmatic uh, president uh, reg regarding to to foreign policy so so I think that's the main question that uh, we still don't know because he's not talking too much about uh, this uh, uh, subject. Uh, and he's not talking about uh, any of uh, his future plans uh, during campaigns. He's focusing on what he did uh, on his uh, term in Brazil. 
So uh, I think that's a question, and that would mean, be maybe a question that our former chancellor could answer here if he was here. But uh, I think mostly what is a uh, concern is Venezuela and Nicaragua more than uh, Colombia and Chile. Mm -hmm. Vince, uh, what is your take? So I agree with Murilo and Ana Clara. Uh, I agree that um, it does not appear that there is elite consensus right now uh, that would allow for a coup to happen. I also uh, think it's absolutely right to point out that Lula's campaign has been very disciplined. Um, and you, you can get why, right? They're not, he's not, the campaign is not talking about big geopolitical um, topics because there's one single message that you could hammer home. And this is, you know, explains that simplicity that I was speaking about that you've been able to hammer home for a year, which is remember me, there was more food in the country when I was the president. Uh, I'm going to bring the food back. And just because that seems to have been working, there has not really been a lot of discussion of sort of the role of the center left in the 21st century or South South relations. Um, but I do think that that it is um, right to say in a very, very broad sense that the return of Lula matters geopolitically, that this could be that you would that it would be um, right to call this something of a, a second pink tide. Of course, different leaders. Um, often uh, movements which are more inflected by um, new concerns that uh, younger younger voters put at the forefront um, uh, during elections. But the, 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 the return of the Workers' Party to Brazil, if this were to happen after Lula was excluded, <laughs> excluded physically from the political scene, uh, when it seemed like the Workers' Party had been uh, nearly destroyed would be, I think, a quite symbolic uh, event and, and, a, and, a, and a one that is concretely significant for the geopolitical order um, globally and especially in South America. It would, re I think, it remains to be seen whether or not uh, the PT, if it is successful at coming back to power, um, would be as inclined as last time to pursue South 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 relations. And yeah, again, Chancellor Amorim was would be the perfect person to talk about this um, because Lula would be entering this time power um, in a less advantaged position than he would than he did uh, in 2003. Right. The Brazilian economy is a mess. People are really suffering. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's about to be a huge influx of um, foreign capital as a result of a commodities boom. So that qu the, the question of how. Um, this shakes out geopolitically, I think would have to, would, would, would is, uh, we would only see later, but I do think it would be ge geopolitically important and, and would, would uh, constitute some part of a, a new, a new center left uh, um, wave in the, the Western hemisphere. When I talked to uh, Marim last time, um, his main, uh, I guess, question or, or maybe his, his main interest was, for Brazil to be able to um, connect with China without regard to any impositions from the United States. So I think that um, there may be some uh, indication there and where Lula is gonna position himself. But yeah, I wish he he had not had that compromise. I wish he had been here. Uh, I'm gonna have uh, a, an open question for, um, um, uh, for the four panelists, I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment, but what are the templates that, so there's a back and forth between what happens in Latin America and what happens in in the United States. I remember vividly that Argentina had Carlos Menem, uh, ultra neoliberal, before uh, the the advent of, the advent, uh, not too much of a word there, but uh of George uh, W. here in the United States. Now there's uh, some parallels between Bolsonaro, um, Trump, Trump, Bolsonaro, Trump. Um, what are the templates that we can actually learn from uh, in this cycle of election, these, the, the, the political discourse and how it's developing from Brazil in, in view uh, to our electoral cycle here in the States? Um, and I open the, the floor for, for, for anybody who would, appreciate, who would like to respond. Well, I can, can I start? Uh, uh, this ideological debate in Latin America is uh, it's fake news, in my opinion, because 
what is driving the politicians and the parties regarding, regardless the label they use, if they are from the left or from the right, is the interests, and they want to to win the election. And when they reach power, they they tend to to behave more or less according to the circumstances. That's why the first administration of Lula was so pragmatic and created a very good economic conditions for the development in Brazil. Uh, and, and I believe this will be more or less the same with the, the, if Lula win again. And also, when you look back to, to Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro came from a, a, a tradition of state intervention, of national uh, state-owned companies. He, he said in the beginning, before the, the election, that he will be against the privatization of Petrobras as the military regime was. And, and then when they reach power, they, they are confronted with the reality. And the reality sometimes are different from the ideology. So what we see is ideology less important than the interest to reach success uh, in power and to permit the re-election or the election of an ally. So uh, what I see is the ideology is much more a kind of fantasy used to run and to mobilize uh, then to be really implemented during the daily basis of a government of an administration. Pablo. Um, Vince, uh, Ana Clara? Well, uh, comparing uh, the two countries and the rise to power of uh, extreme right politicians, well, I think it's uh, more like a, a global movement than uh, something uh, uh, limited to Brazil and, and America, and um, and I think this is uh, this is the new uh, the new uh, future. Like uh, when you have like a lot of people connected uh, and uh, having a voice and. Um, you have politicians that uh, do want to capture uh, these people, so uh, I think I think there is a, a well. I'm listening people, uh, specialists uh, and authorities talking about this, so I'm not telling uh, something from my head. But what uh, they are saying that is that oh, what happens in Brazil and in America and in Italy uh, or. Uh, in Hungary or Turkey, uh, is that uh, you will start to have uh, each, each time more politicians trying to capture uh, this uh, population and especially the population that is suffering more and, and uh, trying to capture them through uh, social media and through uh, technology and try to offer something better and uh, trying to offer a speech that convinced them to, to believe in their plans. So I think it's uh, more like cycles we're gonna live in Brazil, America, and in other countries, France, that almost elected Marine Le Pen. So I think it's something that we have to get used, uh, unfortunately, like this kind of uh, political leadership uh, more populist, more right wing, and more, uh, more uh, giving more attention to uh, the narratives and the and the speeches that may capture uh, in a more efficient way uh, the poor population. Maybe uh, even though uh, a, a lot of members of the elite are also uh, agreeing with them in many ways. So I think it's the new normal, maybe. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I can open the floor if you, if you, Vince, uh, you want to skip this one and, and I can open the floor for questions. Uh, we have, I think, uh, 10 more minutes or so for questions from the audience. Uh, I have one right there. Yes. So, imagining Maureen Le Pen might be without a lot of Russian money in front of I was thinking, is there any more like 
That, okay, um, I don't know if you heard the question, but uh, the mention of Marie Le Pen reminded, um, what's your name? Dimitri of uh, the funneling of uh, Russian money into the French election. If there's any intervention, foreign intervention in the Brazilian elections that you can tell, how is it uh, operating? This is for myself? Um, whoever wants Okay, uh, all right, I can go. Well, uh, this is not, it, it, it can happen, you see, it can happen because uh, the money can, uh, can cross borders uh, without notice, especially now when we have cryptocurrency and other means that can uh, transfer money from one side to another without, uh, under the radar of the authorities. But I don't see a real interest in in interfering in the in the election of Brazil as uh, was suspected to happen in in France in in Brexit in Trump election. I don't see them uh, moving uh, strongly in this favor. They can they can have their preferences. Uh, probably Russia will prefer. Uh, Bolsonaro, China will prefer Lula, for example. The United States is divided uh, in the sense, or oh, Europe prefers Lula, but the financial market is divided. So I do not see this happening, and and uh, as it happened before in Brazil, and also because the regulations uh, today uh, are very strict in, in the use of money during the elections. Uh, so if any candidate appears with much more structure, much more advertising, much more this or much more that, this can uh, raise the suspicion that there's some, something illegal happening and the electoral courts in Brazil are tough. So I think that this could be a big problem for the candidates. Uh, and also uh, the use of the social media. And I agree with Anna, uh, the social media were much more important in last election. Today is important, is important, is really still very important, but not as it was in the, in the last election. Why? Because first of all, people became used to for, for the social media. Second, the social media itself decided to, uh, to self-regulate themselves. So we see Twitter, and Facebook and others taking more care. Uh, and, and finally, because uh, the decisions of the Supreme Court, of the Electoral Court, sometimes against uh, the, the, the social media, were tough in Brazil. And they, they do not like to see Brazil going tough over them because this could serve, uh, could show an example for Europe and the United States. It's funny, but in some sense, the behavior of Brazil in regulating social media is is uh, it's followed with care by Google, Facebook, Twitter, and others because can be an example for other countries. Pablo, I think that uh, we we have a record now because I think that uh, at a minute and fifty three uh, an hour uh, fifty three minutes. Sorry, it's the first time we mentioned the Supreme Court in Brazil. I think that all roundtables. Uh, is the first thing or the second thing that people touch on. So thanks for uh, reminding us that there's a Supreme Court that has a very strong impact on, on the result of the election. Um, so um, any, uh, we have questions, a question there. Um, what's, a good, what's a good place to go? Uh, can can you hear me from here or should I move somewhere else? I, I can re re right. repli uh, um, repeat so your we, question. We've, we've touched on Lava Jato a couple times. Uh, but I'm curious about the legacy of uh, Lava Jato or Operation Car Wash effectively being coup in the front of Bolsonaro into power. And particularly I'm interested in kind of the U.S. involvement in that since the White House has admitted to U.S. Justice Department's um, involvement in uh, Lava Jato and particularly, um, say, Bolsonaro being the first foreign head of state to visit CIA headquarters in Langley. Uh -huh. So are we still seeing a, like an alliance like that? Are we, are we still seeing that relationship? Um, That's a good question. So um, I don't know if you heard it. Uh, I can repeat it. Uh, what is the uh, extent to which the Lava Jato uh, or the car wash affair is still lingering on the, uh, in the imagination of the Brazilian public, I, I, I assume? And what is the extent to which uh, the Brazilian 
public and the voters are um, aware of the connection between the White House and that affair and the fact that Bolsonaro visited Langley and was the first foreign leader to do so here. Um, I mean, is there any, um, is that scandal still present in the Brazilian electorate? Well, uh, I can answer that. Um, I think a good image of how uh, Lava Jato car wash uh, operation is pressing on the elections is the figure of the former judge, Sergio Moro, who was uh, supposed, was was planning to be a candidate uh, for these elections, but uh, he didn't get enough support, political support, so he couldn't uh, run. Now he's running from Senate and it's not, it's far from sure that he wins. So uh, the support tomorrow is somehow uh, an image of uh, how is uh, Lava Jato today. I think, uh, of course, uh, it matters and uh, the corruption uh, uh, tag that uh, it put on politicians uh, is, uh, Still there, but I think it's not a question on these elections. It was a question on 2018, and uh, but it's not uh, anymore. Like people know what Lula did, people know what Bolsonaro did. Uh, they know what governors that are that were investigated did, and uh, I think the thing for this election is more the economic issue, the inflation the income that is uh, falling each year. So uh, corruption is a problem, but it's not pri priority for the, the voters uh, this year because of the economic issue. Yeah, I mean, um, if I could also answer really quickly. Yeah, I mean, Lava Jato in the last couple of years uh, among the population has been uh, lost a lot of its uh, credibility, been discredited. Um, largely because of a couple of Supreme Court decisions, which allowed Lula to run in the first place. Remember, he was not allowed to run in 2018. So the extent to which Lava Jato really shaped Brazilian politics over the last 10 years uh, can't really uh, be overestimated. Everything that we're dealing with now would not be this exact, uh, in the, would, would not exist in this exact same configuration if it were not for Lava Jato, and Lava Jato would not have existed in the exact same way that it did if not for... Um, uh, collaboration uh, with the United States going back to even before the particular judicial mechanisms that allowed Lava Jato to happen um, were brought to Brazil. Um, but yeah, the, 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 it, it goes back to the simplicity um, that I spoke about, about at the beginning. For a lot of people, things are just a lot worse than they were four years ago. Um, people are hungry. You go outside my apartment, there's people everywhere lying on the streets and real, really suffering. Um, so Sergio Moro has seen experienced a really rapid fall from grace as far as at least um, media coverage uh, is concerned. He was treated as a superhero for several years um, by Brazilian media. Without that treatment, I think Lava Jato would not have been possible. Um, that has changed entirely. And I think a lot of the election will be decided on who can help me pay the bills, who can put food on the table. Um, but the question of exactly what Lava Jato did to Brazilian democracy and the interaction that the uh, it that Lava Jato had with the United States during the last ten years, I think, is one that um, journalists and, and historians should continue to pay attention to going forward. Um, I was can I can I see one thing? One please, word, uh, Pablo. Please, yeah. Of yeah. Course. In, in, in our tracking, uh, corruption is the second issue in relevance for the voters. It's still important. See, uh, economic economics. Uh, uh, Unemployment is the issue number one, but corruption is still uh, important for the voters. And one word about Sergio Moro and Lava Jato. When Moro decided to be part of Bolsonaro's administration, he lost all the support that he had from the media. And during the car wash operation, uh, part of the success of the operation was the huge support of the media to the operations, even when he committed or when the car wash operation was committing some not really uh, legal procedures or exaggerating in some measures, the media was very supportive all the time uh, with, with him. But when he moved 
uh, and to, to, to and when he decided to be part of the administration of Bolsonaro, he started to lose uh, the image that he had uh, among the press, and 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 he recovered part of that when he uh, he left the government, but not enough to to put him again as the superhero as he was in the past. And I guess that also it has to do with our second omission in this panel. Uh, and I think that we have to give kudos to ourselves to not have mentioned the pandemic and the management of the pandemic, uh, which is also an issue and was, was an issue, issue for Trump. And I think it was an issue for Bolsonaro. I think we have quite, uh, time for one last question. Um, there in the back, yes. That's a great question. I think we have a Jacobin reader here. Um, if it's th the question is uh, whether it is an actual polarization, or is basically the two parties shifting a little bit to the right, as it happened here, to capture more votes. So, in that sense, is the BT leaning more rightward to capture more votes, or is a real sense of polarization like uh, and and the PT? Um, um, like um, leaning more heavily on its uh, left-leaning um, ideology. Pablo, I have to go, so I would like to thank you all, and I am available for other events like that. I will be in New York in two or three weeks. We can talk. Uh, Vincent, um, Anna, thank you very nice. much. Pablo, thank you. thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right, so then, since... Since he's gone, I'll try to answer that really quickly. And I bet Ana Clara um, has something to say too. Uh, Lula has not moved to the left compared to his last government, I don't think. I think he, the, the PT um, is either in the same place. Like, I would say that the PT is in the same place in terms of the project that it presents for the country at the same time that it is reaching across the aisle. And again, there's lots of different aisles in Brazil. It's not the same as the US um, to form a sort of popular front with other sort of anti uh almost anti-fascist forces or anti um extremist forces so yeah i don't i don't think i don't i think that the polarization is happening in the sense that being a bolsonarism was very different than what the pt is but the pt has not moved to the radical left i think that's really like that's that's a very silly way to think about it um they're staying more or less where they are in terms of policy but reaching out to former uh rivals and enemies to create the, the broadest possible uh, alliance to to win the election uh, Anna? Well, uh, I'd just like to add that uh, in the sense of trying to make a coalition, uh, a center coalition uh, to fight Bolsonaro, it included uh, talks with uh, MDB, which is the, the party that uh, of the former president Michel Temer, who was uh, uh, Dilma, Dilma Rousseff's vice president and and was the president after the impeachment. So uh, the two parties were in a big fight after that because of because they were uh, a coalition that stopped and uh, because of impeachment. And now they are talking again, even though uh, MDB has a candidate that is going probably to lose, even though they are talking to Lula, uh, looking at the future uh, in the government. So I think uh, that is um, an example of uh, how things are going. Uh, and I agree with uh, Vincent that uh, I don't see Lula uh, going to the extreme side of the left. He's very pragmatic uh, politicians, as we said here. Of course, he has to, to respond to 
to his base of uh, allies, like his base of uh, supporters that expect from him some kind of uh, formulations and uh, and uh, plans for uh, human rights and environment and uh, everything. So uh, he has to respond to them, but uh, I, I don't see like him going to the left more than he has ever been. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I think we're leaving with a, with a much more clear image of what to expect, what's happening, what's the impact of the uh, of the Brazilian election on, on, on the world and on, on the United States. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, had you here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.